white picket fences, clipped hedges, well-maintained lawns. From the outside, it looks like the American dream. But what the community of Levittown was built on doesn't include all Americans. The builder Levitt had in his um, deeds something that said, you can, this property can only be sold to Caucasian people. Now, we have to remember, those deeds were approved by the federal government. Dolores and Erwin Quintine experienced this government-approved racist policy firsthand when they went looking for a home in Levittown in the 1960s. The guy said, you know what you get your out of here because we don't sell the Established 1947, but how Levittown was established has an effect on American culture today, not just in Levittown, but nationwide. William Levitt built the first mass-produced suburb in the country, and what happened in this 17,000 home development set the standard for thousands of communities coast to coast. The only way that Levitt could build that subdivision was by going to the Federal Housing Administration and the Veterans Administration, getting a bank guarantee for the loans to buy the land and build the homes. But the banks blocked out in red on maps neighborhoods that had even one black person living there and refused to make loans there. It's why Levittown said no to black buyers at all. We went to the office where the gentleman was showing the houses. So my husband said to him, my wife and I are interested in, you know, purchasing a home here in Levittown. He said, get your out of here. Richard Rothstein is one of the foremost researchers on housing discrimination in the U.S. The federal government even required Levitt to place a clause in the deed of every home in Levittown, prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans. Those deeds are still in the homes today. They can't be removed. They're no longer enforceable, but there it is, not to permit the premises to be used or occupied by any person other than members of the Caucasian race. Louise Cassano has lived in Levittown since her parents brought her here in 1951, and she and her husband bought their home here 13 years later. I don't doubt that a number of people bought into the community for the reason uh, that it was Caucasian only. I have never heard of any incidents in this community where people of color have been abused in any way. But there may be a reason for that. Even today, just over 1% of Levittown residents are black, just under 84% are white. That's the problem with discrimination and racism. It carries forward. When Levitt built his homes, there was no down payment for veterans, and for anyone else, it was $10. That's just $120 today, adjusted for inflation. And the homes cost about $8,000, the equivalent of $96,000 of today's dollars. Prices black families could afford. But now, the value of a Levittown home? $500,000, perhaps. The white families gained equity. Housing advocate Ian Wilder says that created a huge divide of wealth. Which could be used to put children through school, which means through, through college, which means those children have a shot at a better paying job. The families that couldn't buy here lost $400,000 worth of equity. That segregation, enforced by the government and kept in place to this day, means that most whites have lived separately from blacks for generations. Now, there were a few exceptions in the years after World War II. Well, sort of. Madeline Quintine shows us the clippings about her dad, a community leader. He was the man run out of Levittown nearly 60 years ago. My father was about home ownership. Erwin Quintine was finally able to buy a home here in Ronek Park. The North Amityville subdivision, four miles from Levittown, advertised that all men are created equal. It was basically where African Americans live. And while they did build up equity, it was separate and unequal. North Amityville is now 92% black or Latino and has a median income of about $73,500. That's 62 cents for each dollar Levittowners earn. 
So the housing discrimination that started 70 years ago in Levittown and spread nationwide created the wealth gap for African-American families today. Only in America. That's all I can tell you. Only in America would this happen, I guess. James, what are some other ways this historical segregation has played out? Well, Tamsin, it plays out in even more ways involving housing. Get this, a pair of detailed studies recently showed that nationwide, black-owned homes are charged much higher property taxes than those owned by whites. But black-owned homes are typically valued a lot lower than white-owned homes, sometimes when they're right next door to each other. The deeds in Levittown homes have a clause, not to permit any person other than members of the Caucasian race. We have to remember, those deeds were approved by the federal government. Thousands of communities of color nationwide were put into the zones you see in red. It's called redlining, a practice by the federal government, which in effect prohibited banks from investing in black neighborhoods or with black people. The result is that most white Americans have lived separately from blacks for generations. What do we want? Justice! What do we want? Now! A fact emphasized by protesters today looking to change the landscape. They've even marched in Levittown. We have to acknowledge the painful things that happened in our past and look towards a better future. The place that once only let white people purchase homes. We need major actions to break those chains. I call it remedies. Those remedies should be significant financial compensation to blacks nationwide. Find the name of the bank that guaranteed those loans. That bank owes reparations. That bank should be setting up a fund to subsidize African-Americans. I do agree with the reparations. And it, if it comes to pass, I don't know, but if it does come to pass, it should have been a long time ago. And could be a long time from now, if ever. In the meantime, there are other measures attempting to challenge American inequities. Right here in New Jersey and in Massachusetts, state laws provide for what's called fair share housing. It's where at least 10% of all new housing in every community in the state must include homes for low-income residents who tend to be people of color. Mount Laurel, New Jersey, had to adopt fair share housing 20 years ago. And while critics feared crime would rise and school test scores would drop, instead, property values rose, and what dropped were obstacles for advancement for kids of color in the local schools. Do you recommend that they do more? In New York, and specifically on Long Island, state legislators, led by Senator Kevin Thomas of Levittown, have required realtors to testify about long-standing practices of steering black home buyers away from predominantly white communities. There's a spotlight on them, saying, what exactly are you doing to train your real estate agents? And those real estate agents that did not show up, we subpoenaed them. And remember the Levittown deed restricting occupancy to members of the Caucasian race? The wording is actually still in those deeds, but they're no longer enforceable because of the 1968 Fair Housing Act. The time is here. Action must be now. But it's still why this summer, Nassau County legislators called for a data archive to be created so homeowners and buyers can see if their homes and communities have racist deeds and covenants. The Quintines are among countless families turned away from their American dream just because they're black. But Erwin Quintine, the father, actually became a prominent fair housing activist, as pointed out on this plaque on the town building bearing his name and in this state proclamation. Our community a better place by working to dismantle discrimination. His daughter Madeline is now a commissioner for the town of Babylon. And six decades after her family was run out of Levittown, She's the owner of a large home with a pool in a high-end neighborhood. And on the day we met, her brother closed on his second home. There are advances to be sure. But as the Quintine family matriarch, a housing advocate in her own right, points out, we've all only come so far. Don't go home and sit down because once you won one battle, it will mean that that's finished because once you win one, another one's going to come up.
All right. Well, that's James Ford reporting. You know, we, James, we did hear Dolores Quint, uh, Quintine say there are a lot more battles to be fought. So what else lies ahead in the fight for housing discrimination and reparations? Well, Craig and Tamsin, for one, you may recall that in the story, a state senator said that any realtors who didn't respond to invitations to testify about discrimination were subpoenaed. Those subpoenas, which are not easy to obtain, have been sent out, and the state Senate says a hearing with Coldwell Banker, Remax, Keller Williams, and Realty Connect USA is scheduled for later this month. Erwin Quintine, unfortunately, passed away and will not get to see this important moment 